Okay, so Jen was telling me earlier off the air that um, she had her first experience with uh, a weightless float yesterday. If you could tell yes. me about how you got it, because I've done it three times myself, but um, how did you how did you come to go to the float place? So my good friend that I was saying earlier was the massage therapist. She's into all that kind of stuff. And around the holidays, I was looking to get her a little something, and I was like, oh, let me look into that. I'll get her a gift certificate to go do some floats, or was it for her birthday? Regardless, it was one of the two. And when I was trying to book it, I wasn't able to do it. And I wound up calling, there were two locations. I called the second location and got the owner who I was on the, wound up on the phone with for about 20 minutes. He was awesome. And he was like, you should really try it. This, that, and the other things. So I said, fine. I bought myself a session and I decided to go last night for the first time. You have to watch a whole video. It kind of explains it. I had an idea of what it was, but you don't really know what you're about to experience until you do it. it <laughs> so when I finished, I fought to stay in there the entire time because I, I went back to my yoga mentality, like hot yoga. They, if you are unable to do something, they don't want you to leave the room. They want you to just lay down. It's hot. Sometimes you get overheated. One of the moves may be more challenging one week than the other. Just lay down, stay in the room. When you've collected yourself, you join back in. So I kind of tried to use that mentality to stay in the float as long as possible because it was really, really difficult for me. Difficult for you to not freak out because you were in a, a, a tiny little chamber? No, that, no, that I, I'm okay with that. I was used to be a flight attendant. So like That's small, <laughs> Small spaces don't bother me. My first issue when I got in was I felt like I couldn't breathe. And I don't know if it was the position because you're kind of, you're, you're literally just floating in a foot of water. I think it's about 11 inches. I couldn't get myself like in a way, a, a position where I felt like I was comfortable breathing. So I'm like, all right, just slow to like slow in and slow out. And then I was like, okay, fine. So I relaxed for a little bit and then my shoulders started aching. I'm like, okay, let's try to move around. And then it was my back and then my legs. And, I, you know, once you're, I think, then in that spiral of discomfort, there's not necessarily any going back. <laughs> but I stayed in pretty much the entire time. But I was fidgeting for a really good part of it. Huh. <laughs> so it was not relaxing as it could have been or should have been. But he, the owner did say you have to, most people need to do it more than once to get like to that point, right? whether or not I'm that person that's going to get to that point, I have no idea, but I will try it again. Right. So I, uh, where I, my apartment, where I was in Huntington village for people who know Huntington village, I, I was across from the book review. Uh, and there's a place called lift, which unfortunately is closed, but it was around the block from the book review. So by distance, it was no more than 300 feet from, from my apartment. So very, very close and very convenient. So I did three three floats there. Um, How all, long were they? An hour. Oh, this was ninety minutes. Okay, but all all Whew. three times uh, they were basically what you would call dates. <laughs> now I was not in the I wasn't in the tank with a young lady, so I mean that would be a little bit crazy. <laughs> but but it was like um, so one year it was Valentine's Day. It was actually the day before Valentine's Day, so they had like a special where. Um, it was a couple's float, but it was a couple's float, but you weren't floating with the person yeah. that you were with. They it were in a separate chamber. Purpose. Right. Could you imagine? Right. God, you know, they try to keep it clean. It might get a little messy. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not really you exaggerating. Right? You don't want that on your no private bits. <laughs> because, right, somebody's got to get in there and clean it. It's a whole, yeah. As my grandpa would say, it's a whole to do. It's a whole to do. It's still here. That's what he would say. Yeah, you don't want to mess with that. Somebody's got to clean up after you, Junior. Not good. Um, no, but but the um, the idea of the couples float and on Valentine's Day, for example, was that you each would get a chamber, and we didn't watch a video, but they explained what what was going to happen. Yeah. We recommend that you you know you take your clothes off again alone. Each person has their own shower. You're not in the same room with your partner, except when they're explaining ahead of time. You're just yeah. kind of chilling on the couch. And so you each go into your own um, immersion tank. And um, man, I, each time I did it, I thought it was great. And I'm, I'm by nature a nervous kind of a personality. Mm -hmm. 
And I feel like within a couple of minutes, maybe there was more water in the tank. It felt like it was more like two or three feet, not Was it inches. something you enclosed yourself in or was it you stepped into a room? Stepped into a room. Okay, that's, what I, door. that's how this place was also. Um, and so within a couple of minutes, I feel like I reached a, a state of complete peace and quiet. Wow. And so all three times within five minutes, the last 55 minutes was fantastic where it almost felt like I wasn't sure where my, my hands began and mm -hmm. my, my legs ended it, it. It's bizarre. If you haven't experienced it, you're just like, right. So there, there is a movie that I, that I have talked about, um, not with you, but th there's a, a science fiction film from the early eighties called altered states in which the main character was played by William Hurt, who unfortunately passed not that long ago. Um, he is a scientist, a genius and a researcher and he does these weird experiments where he goes into an immersion tank, just like what we're talking about, but he does it while taking about 10 different kinds of psychotropic drugs to oh. see exactly where it'll take him. Well, and I don't know. <laughs> it actually takes him to places you really don't expect where he begins <laughs> to regress uh, physiologically and start turning to other kind of states of being like Neanderthal man. It's movie is completely That's bonkers, bizarre, yeah. totally insane. But as far as the float, all of my experiences were great. And the fact that I lived so close by was very comforting. I know that's lame. I'm not five years old and I'm close to home, but it was really nice. So when each time you get out of the, um, you get out of the chamber, you, know, you put your clothes on. And if you do, if you're doing, for example, a couple's float, because even if it isn't Valentine's Day, they have the same kind of thing. They just called it the Valentine's Day float because it was, it was Valentine's Day. They took an extra couple of bucks off. But when you come out, they give you a bottle of, of champagne, nothing crazy, like twenty, oh, wow. thirty dollar champagne. That's and, nice. And they, yeah, and they give you like um Jardelli like chocolates. And that's that's where you kind of chill there for fifteen or twenty minutes. It's a nice experience, mm -hmm. especially if you have, as I did, the kind of warm glow of wow, that float was fantastic. You know, it wasn't late, it's like seven thirty at night or whatever. Yeah. And um, you know, you could go on with your evening, but yeah, my, my experiences were were all really, really good, where I almost didn't want to get out of the tank because I was just so relaxed. I think I the, last, the last two times I was, I believe I basically was drifting in and out of consciousness and I was stunned. I was, was hoping that was going to happen because I was so exhausted. I'm like, Friday night, this right. is the best night to do this. For sure. I worked all week, the gym, whatever, and it, oof, it did not go the way I had anticipated. Like yeah. you go, you take a shower, you got to clean all the stuff off of yourself before you go in, you go into your little tank. Yeah. I was like, if I had an idea of what the time was, so I had, and I don't know, I guess that's a control thing. Like I wanted to know how much time I had left right. to relax. And he's like, well, that's part of the shutting the outside yeah. world off. Right, right. And I'm like, but it would have made me feel better to know. Like it was the not knowing that I was like, oh my gosh, has it been 15 minutes or has it been 45 minutes? Because I was fidgeting for a very, very long time. You see, it's, it's such a strange thing. It was, and it was 90 minutes. That's a long time to right. be in there not knowing what the heck is going but, but on. But one, one, one of the great things about human experience, if there are any much younger people that are watching this video and, and kind of trying to figure this out. So I am claustrophobic very claustrophobic and I'm afraid of heights. Okay. She was a flight attendant. Being in an immersion tank is not supposed to be something that I should be able to even think about doing, let alone do, let alone be able to reach a state of Zen where I'm not freaked out. Oh, but thing is claustrophobic. If I'm in an elevator by myself, I may start screaming immediately. Like I'm that, I'm that absurd. I'm okay with flying though. I've been on flights. I had a flight home from Florida in 2010. I'll never forget this. Um, it was not what you would call heavy turbulence, but you, I'm sure, experience where nothing terrible is happening, but two and a half hours, the plane was bouncing around. <laughs> it was nothing awful, but there had been some shitty weather up the coast, Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. And when I tell you, happens. from Fort Lauderdale to Islip, the plane was bouncing for two and a half hours and I am claustrophobic and afraid of heights and I was perfectly fine. And there's people chucking their guts up all around me who are not <laughs> claustrophobic and afraid of heights. So these, 
these things don't always follow the way you expect. Yeah. But the thing, what we're both doing here, we're recommending that you try this kind of thing for yourself yeah. because you might love it. Yes. I was not a candidate. The odds were that she was going to like it more than me. Mm. And I, I'm actually surprised that it didn't, that it ended up almost being painful and, and, and frustrating was, and yeah. aggravating for you. The, they, <laughs> they, they couldn't believe it when I got out and they're like, how, how was it? And I was like, that was really difficult. And he just looked at me like, yeah, like unexpected. You know, I have anxiety. I tend to have the mind racing thing. Sure, I expected sure. to get in there and be able to relax. Right. I can lay in a pool all day. I can lay next to the pool. The Did they sun. play new aging music? Did you get it? No, show? there was okay, no so we music. Had, you have earplugs the, in. Right. The lift place. Well, yeah, they, they, they to protect our ears. Mm -hmm. But the lift place, you did have a choice of if you wanted the kind of chill trance type music. I probably would have enjoyed having some sort of music in the background or something. Right. Um, the one thing he did say after the fact was try a different time of the day. He said the evening you might have thought would have been the best time for you right, to go. Right, that's when I did it. I thought he it was, said, yeah. try early in the morning. He said, because you're still half asleep. I mean, I have to drive from where I live to Patchogue, which yeah, is yeah. going to you know, be a little bit of a ride. So I'll be awake by the time I get there. But I was like, you know what? I hadn't even thought. He's like, try first thing in the morning. Try midday. And he also suggested, um, I did buy, there's like a Valentine's special. It's funny that you said that. Right. An infrared sauna. You sit in there for 45 minutes and then you do the float. Okay. So he said that, so changing the time of the day and trying to do the infrared sauna first might relax you more. So I'm like, I'll try it. Right. I have well, two know, more you know sessions. To, right. You know what to expect. If it doesn't work out, it's not for me. Yeah. But right. at least no, I would say, say I tried it. No, a hundred percent. I would say that if, if 15 <coughs> minutes, me. it's okay. If 15 minutes into the second session, if you're ready to rip your, somebody's face off, then right. But, but, you know, hopefully it, it does work and you're able to. Well, and the, what, is it that bad that you laid in an Epsom, Epsom salt bath for 90 minutes? Cause it's, it's, it's good for you anyway. So right. I kind of tried to just take, take the positive out of the uncomfortable yeah. experience. Yeah, it's funny. That, that's, I got an Epsom salt bath. I wasn't even thinking of that. The, yeah. An underrated good part is that. At that the end, I really did feel like a million bucks. Yeah. I didn't, I, I I'm, geez, I'm not achy. So it is, it is a healthful thing yes. on top of what we're talking about, which is why we're, um, you know, and neither one of us are promoting this, like the, the lift place in Huntington's out of business. Right. They weren't because they, I guess they weren't charging enough money to do what they were doing. Now, one thing I, I have seen you do on social media, and I feel like people would be kind of get a kick out of this. Um, what is your, um, you've gone to axe throwing. Yes. Okay. So tell me a little, cause I've never done that. Tell me a little bit about. Uh, oh throwing. my gosh, it is so much fun. It's literally, depending on where you go, some of the places are like a physical target, like you could en envision. And you do like a little course where they, t they teach you, there's two different sizes. There's a longer handled um, hatchet and a shorter. You can throw one handed, you can throw two handed. It's, it's really fun. It's, it's really fun. Some people are better at it than they thought that they would be. Right. Some, so if you need zombies killed, you know, I'm your girl. And then some people who think they're going to be really good at it. No. Because it's not like anything that you would do normally. So it's, right. a, it's a good date idea. It's fun to do with your friends. So I've gone to a few different places. Some of them now have, um, it's electric. So there's like the board that you're throwing at is wood and there's a projector that either is pro projecting a target or different games. You can do tic-tac-toe. There's like killing zombies. There's duck hunts. So it's, it really is fun. Okay. Um, let me think. What are, what's something that you've always wanted to do, an activity that you've always been interested in but never actually did? Like, for example, I've never thought about doing axe throwing. I mean, if I go the rest of my life and never try axe throwing, I, I'll, I'll You'll be, be okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll, I'll survive. But is there, is there anything that you're like, this is something I really hope that I have an opportunity to do that you haven't done or, you know, like what, uh, what's on it? Because we all have like bucket lists. Like you probably have, um, you probably have places you'd love to go, for example. It's a vacation? Yeah. 
I really would like to go, go to the Maldives. That's a great because spot. you just you see the the images and the huts on the water and I'm like oh my gosh can I just go there and not have clothes on for a week straight and like be in the water having food brought to you and cocktails but there's a weird thing about there that I read it's something with the religion of the country and you really like can't be going outside the huts and the and like drinking. There was something. It was very conservative, I want to say. But I mean, if you're in your hut, just let loose. <laughs> right. That's one spot that I really would. That's like a dream vacation spot. Okay. So what what would you? What's your favorite Caribbean spot that you've been to, or have you been to any place more than once? I mean, I've been to the Bahamas a few times, but I feel like you're just going there and you're like surrounded by people that you know. Okay. Um, I've been to the Dominican Republic a couple of times. I did, when I was a flight attendant, we did a lot of Europe traveling. So. Okay, so actually that's something I wanted to ask you. Um, so for example, I, I have a friend who was an air marshal. Okay. And he did a lot of international travel where he was one of the guys. And I'm sure someone like that would have to tell you. We, um, we know who they are, yeah. Uh, right, that's what I meant. And he said in his entire career, now he, was a, um, he was a security contractor. I know that's a cliche. You know, it sounds like something in the movies. But he was somebody who had been um, not a Green Beret. The, um, I think the Marines version of a Green Beret. Whatever it is. He, he, oh. he was somebody who was, who was very, very skilled. You know, like a Liam Neeson in the movie Taken, like a guy you wouldn't want to piss off. He's because drink of water. <laughs> he's got 30, 31 different ways to kill you in two, three seconds. But because of his military background, um, after 9-11 happened, he, was, he wasn't recruited, but he said, hey, I have the, he was a very young man at the time. Yeah. I, I have the, the background to do this. So he was a guy who basically his cover was that he wore, he had the kind of suitcase or, um, you know, briefcase with him where he appeared to be in a financial industry. Mm -hmm. be, your guess would have been this is a stock like broker. This is, and he said in, in all of the flights that he flew internationally, he only had to identify himself to the passengers once. Like that is how rare it was that anything yeah. weird would happen. And it was a domestic situation where a guy and his wife were fighting and the guy was intoxicated. And oh, they said, Lord. I think this guy is like taking some kind of, real serious um, antipsychotic medication. He may have forgotten it. So he just basically got up and he, and he basically had his gun like Control at the ready. Control the scene. Exactly. Um, that he was able to do that. Um, I can't even imagine. But what, what I was going to say, when you flew internationally, how did it work as far as how much time like you would spend a night there or two nights or did you always just fly right home? No, for international, because of the regulations, um, you always had 24 hours there because you needed minimum rest. Like you had maximum work hours. You needed minimum rest for certain things. Right, that, that, that's what I'm referring to. So, so, and, and the reason why I say this is that this is something that a person like me, who not that I'm incurious, but it isn't something that I would have ever thought about. And a regular person, you, you, you meet a flight, a flight attendant, oh, she's hot, whatever it is. You, I, but, but I was the kind of person, that's what I might focus on. You know, and there was a famous book in the 60s, Coffee, Tea, or Me. You know? yeah. and, then that, and then that was a thing where you a always... Man thing. Right. A, a, sweaty, a sweaty 16 year old boy always imagined that the attractive flight attendant was going to do something like that. But when my friend was telling me, I'd say, so let's say, <laughs> I'd say, Kev, let's say you flew to, you flew to Tel Aviv, for example, a long flight from JFK, or yeah. it could be LAX, wherever. I said, so you, they put you up in a hotel. Like, I was genuinely interested. It's not something I would have ever thought about. And in my mind, if somebody had asked me before becoming friendly enough with this guy that he would tell me what he was doing and say, yeah, I would fly here and I would come back. I just assumed that if you live in New York, you would always find your way back to New York at the end of your shift. I, I never said, no, 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 she probably is going to spend the night in California. Well, well your shift may be one day, your shift may be four days, so that all varies. Right. And you have to differentiate. International is technically Canada. Right. South America, Mexico. Like, international is not necessarily what you think. Transoceanic 
is when you're crossing the pond and you're going overseas. Right. So there's the did terms ever, are a little um, different. Did you ever fly on a Concorde? No, I don't think that they were flying. Oh, they were already out of. I, I feel like they were so. decommissioned in two thousand and like. And we or didn't four. have. I don't think. Did any domestic carriers have them? No, actually, it's funny you say that. See, I, I should. I think Air France. The British Airways and Air France. That was it. Okay. Yeah, we so could shared with Air France, but I believe okay. that they were not flying anymore. When I, I started flying in three twenty four ninety eight. <laughs> okay, I, yeah, I feel so like I don't I, know if the Concorde was still. In there were the still air. a couple of birds. Yeah, they I don't know. I know that there, there, there were some issues where there was almost a, a crash or there was a major electrical problem, and I guess that British Airways just decided to decommission. It's like they were. Too many issues. The cost, I would think, yeah. also. I just remember, I always ask when I when I find out that someone is a flight attendant, because there is, I, I, it's the kind, that's something that I would always ask on right. a flight, going back for, for a couple of decades, where if the flight attendant didn't seem like they were a lot younger than me, I asked if they ever flew a Concorde, and one person actually said yes, and they told me that it was scary as shit. Oh, really? When a flight attendant is telling you that a bird is scary as shit, that is not something that I would have wanted to be on. I said, wait a minute. I actually said... Why, Why did they find it scary? She said it was like being on a roller coaster. The that G4s. you were going to be on for four hours. She said it was really... Really? And, and not even turbulence. She said, the way I would describe it is I felt how fast we were going. And, yeah. and you know, even as a person, when you fly and you're not a flight attendant, you, you have moments where the plane is going 600 miles an hour or whatever it is, and you can barely feel it. Yeah, moving. you can't Especially tell. if you have wind at your back. She said that she felt everything. And when the plane, when the bird dipped, it felt like she was on a roller coaster. Like it pitched. And the, the look on her face, not that this means anything, but while she was telling the story, you could tell that she was remembering it. And like her face was twisted like it was a terrible memory. I'm like, I wasn't trying to do that. I'm not trying to ruin your flight. Funny. I'd never heard that. Yeah, she said you know, we huh. felt everything. It was like being on a roller coaster, the up and down. Interesting. So, all right. So nothing, um, you never flew on it. Now, what was the longest continuous flight you ever took? Probably like from where to where? To, you... From JFK to Moscow. Wow! In one yeah. shot. Yeah. So again, I wouldn't four have known times. That, there, that I wouldn't have known that there was enough fuel to even do that. I don't yeah. Know any of these That's things. what happened. So when I started flying as an on-call flight attendant for Delta in New York, you ha you were required to get a visa, a work visa, to travel to France and to Russia. Right. So. If you were on call, you were required to have these because if somebody called out, if there was some sort of last minute thing, they needed to be able to short call us <laughs> to go on these trips to cover. Like, cause you, they didn't, if the standby that we had people stand by every airport all the time, but if the standby was used, you needed to be able to call somebody from home. So I had the visa and, and was <laughs> short called, I think four times to go to Moscow. Yeah, I so think that was my long, longest. But but in, it, if all goes according to Hoyle, how many hours direct in the air from JFK to the airport in Moscow? I don't remember. Is Nine, it 20? No. So I don't, no. Because I feel like Israel or like Tel Aviv is 20 plus from JFK. I don't, I've never one? flown. No, okay. we had Tel Aviv at one point, but I never, I never okay. was. But it was 12 um, hours plus to Moscow, Yeah, Bombay. Right? No, I don't think it, it wasn't was that long. long. I want to say 10. Okay. 9 or 10. I, I could be wrong because well, it's been no, a long but time. When it's you, been see, again, 20 I, years. Right. I, I know the geography, and, and I'm imagining like JFK across the pond to London, and then you say, well, from, well, from London to Russia, would right, right. But from London to Russia wouldn't be 12 hours. Like no. off the top of my head, I would say. Because okay. even it going to Italy is in the 8s or 9s, I guess, depending on what your... Winds are like and all that. Was there a particular reason why you why you stopped being a flight attendant, or was it you just felt you went as far as you could go in that so field? I had gone when JetBlue opened. That was like it became the hot thing, like the lower cost sure. air. Well, you they know, hit travel. it because there was another carrier called People Express in the early 80s, which which was really hot for a time. My mom was a flight attendant, and she thought that was going to catch on. They must have had some management issues because what JetBlue became, it looked like People Express was going to do. The idea was it blew up. really, really good planes and budget as far as that they cut out of, uh, overhead and you pay for it. Whatever right. it was, they had a model that was similar, but it just it didn't it didn't take so fire. Maybe it was work, a little before yeah. its time. I don't know. 
I, when I started flying with Delta, we had Delta Express. So that was, I believe, cheaper airfare, like to and from Florida out of New York, which is huge out of here. You know, a lot of people, right. those routes are really um, popular. So that, they did away with that and they created Song, which was to compete with JetBlue. So that. those yeah. of us who were Delta flight attendants who were interested had to interview and get hired to do it because hmm. they only wanted a certain type of person to right. be the crew and whatever, okay. the face of the airline. So sure. I loved it. I got in. I was holding much better trips than I would hold in the main line. That's what it was called. I flew only out of Kennedy. I did transcons, so that's coast-to-coast -coast flights, and right. Florida here and there. And when that, I guess, wasn't making enough money on its own, they were merging that back into the main line. And I was like, I, I don't want to go to Newark anymore. I don't want to go. After 9-11, I did not want to go overseas anymore because people got stuck places sure. for a really long time. Yeah. You only have so much clothes with you. That's right. How much money do you have on you? I mean, you can go to the bank and all that, yeah. but... You know, you got to remember this is a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. No, I, so I, I, I was like, I think this is my chance to do something different. And Delta, when they needed to cut back staffing because we were non-union, would offer um, voluntary furloughs. So people who had things they wanted to do in their life could take a voluntary furlough, stay on as an inactive employee. Potentially, there was, you had to choose a base to go back to if you were called back. So we knew which bases would never get called back. So if you wanted to stay on furlough, you chose those bases, which is what I did. And I went back to school. <laughs> oh, smart. <laughs> so I just knew because we were so top heavy seniority wise with the Pan Am flight attendants. My seniority was not going to go anywhere anytime soon. And it just wasn't like a career for me. I went oh, to yeah. college I wanted more out of life than just, and this is not putting anybody down. I, I didn't want to pour drinks for the rest of my life. Like I yeah. wanted to do something where people really counted on us and appreciated us. And that's why I chose healthcare. Right. Right. Which you, you try to find your why. Yeah. And, uh, find, so that was my it. journey that, right. you know, it's not for everybody, but yeah, and, and, and I didn't way, want to do a mindless job anymore. Like to me, it was just, I, I, I wanted more for myself. Right. Personally, well, you know, you did and you, you do a lot of you do a lot of different things. Now, if you were to like, let's say you could we could reboot the Matrix and you could you could be 22 again or 23 and some mysterious benefactor, because this is after all, we're rebooting the Matrix so we could do whatever we want. <laughs> but if you could have if you could have excelled, like become a, uh, a small business powerhouse in any field. Like, in what, what line would you want to have been, you know, to have been a small business owner that made an incredible success? Like, is there anything that you no. would... Okay. I've never, ever had any interest or desire to be in a, a business owner or okay. anything like that. Never. If I could go back in time, I would have become a cop because I would have been retired. Right, you would be different benefits. My dad worked for the Port Authority in finance. He was a property manager um, at LaGuardia when he retired. So he kind of like worked his way up over many years. And I had uncles who were Port Authority cops. And I'm like, why did you not force me to do it? And he's like, Jennifer Ann, you wanted no part of it. I'm like, all the crap you made me do over the years and you didn't force me to do something where I could get in at 22, retire, in my early forties and have a good pension. Like yeah. you didn't force me to do that. <laughs> yeah, and listen, my, my mom ended up, uh, you know, she did a lot of different things. She was a bookkeeper. She did regular accounting work and, um, she ended up, you know, that she was a travel agent. She ended up working for the IRS and, um, she got a great government. Pension, right. You know, but, but she kind of happened upon that. There mm -hmm. also, there was not any master plan or any idea. It wasn't like, um, you know, for example, you, you get a stable teaching job out of college and yes, you could theoretically get fired, but the idea is that that is something that is a safe position Sure. that may not, uh, it may not become 80 hours a week. You know, you never know. Every, every situation is different, but that it is, it, it is a safe 
option that you will have something when you retire that is that's actually a pension as opposed to just a 401. Well, you think back to when you were, uh, you know, I'm a young 22 year old graduating college. My mom's like, all right, you need to find a job. And I'm like, um, right. I had, you know, you don't always really, oh, young people who have some sort of passion or direction they know they want to go in. That's oh, yeah. amazing. Yes. I just was like, okay, my mom's like, okay, Delta's hiring, put in an application because yeah. she had a friend that worked for Business Express. Right. And that's how I wound up becoming a flight attendant. And then, you know, I did that for almost 10 years. And I was like, I need to go back to school. Right. Um, okay. So from from the perspective of younger people, and uh, it's, not, it's not really a cliche to say that in general and relatively speaking, um, cost of living is higher than it was. That, you know, it's, and this is something that's real. Yeah. That in the in the late 1960s and early 70s, it was possible for one wage earner to support a house, pay a mortgage, et cetera, et cetera. This is why me personally, why I don't subscribe to the theory that younger people today are lazier. Yes, there are people who are lazier and assholes in general, but I know plenty of Gen Z people who are working three jobs and they're already buried in debt. So I don't, I don't go for the whole, you know, all encompassing, everything is black or white. There's a, I, I like, I prefer nuance. I like nuance. So what I was going to say is as a, as a younger person who is interested in people who are nowhere near retirement, <laughs> no. but people who maybe have found their way, maybe didn't hit it immediately or didn't immediately start making good money. So in your, in, in Jen's case, I'm going to speak at a turn here, uh, not really that at a turn, but like me, she has been married, doesn't have any human children. I have three cats. <laughs> human children. <laughs> but, but Jen is, she is a homeowner yeah. and I am a homeowner. And now, so if you could explain to people who, unfortunately, if they're buried in debt, being a homeowner is a pipe dream at this Ooh. time for many young people, even if they're successful, sure. it's going to be very difficult. So yep. how did you, like, if you could tell us, um, when did you become a homeowner? And, you know, all, all of that kind of good in my stuff. my 40s. So I was always good with money. I was a saver. As soon as I started working, I started the 403. I, maybe it was a 401k. But either way, 403b, 401k. Regardless, I, had, I always had that because that I was taught very young. And I wasn't a spender. Like, I didn't live beyond my means. I think that this is a huge problem in this generation. They're getting their hair done. They're getting their eyelashes done. They're getting their nails done. They're driving a BMW. Where do you live, though? Do you have any money in the bank? Yeah, right. I, that 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 is a real thing. But you know what? We kind and of. I'm not trying to sound like an old lady. No, 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 but no, no. But 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 this this is real, and um, people are not. Their things that they find important are going to bite them in the ass in the long, in the long run. Yeah, right. Sure. And see, being fitness people, we understand the concept of short-term pain, long-term gain. And yes, it is It is true that, for example, you have, you're going out, just a regular, not getting your nails done for a, a public event or something, sure, but you're going out different. on a Friday, going out with the girls or going out with the guy, whatever it might be. And you're spending $300 of your hard-earned money on hair, on nails, bikini wax, whatever it is you might be doing. Or, or, or from a guy's perspective, I, and you remember this, there was a time about 20 years ago where guys were getting their eyebrows done. Yeah. It seems to be that it happened way more then than now. I feel like a lot of guys say, I'm not doing this anymore. There's I, nothing wrong with looking good. No, men there's and nothing women. wrong with looking good, but within, within normal parameters. And it's you're not being a fuddy-dud and you're not, oh, I just want to live my life. If you're aware of what you're doing, if you're careful, you know, and especially if you have other people in your life that you're, you know, that you're concerned with. So, so you, no you, one's going to remember you for your fake eyelashes, ladies. Right. Um, okay. <laughs> just saying it. Yeah. A lot so, of you look silly, but that's just my. <laughs> when, when, when you got married. I digress. <laughs> you, you weren't, you weren't a homeowner when you were married. You were, you were. No. Hard well, work. so he had a house. I was still living at home because I was a flight attendant. I was never home. Right. Um, he had a house and I moved into his house. Okay. Well, again, obviously that's not, that's not so unusual. Right. So give, give me, let us know the steps of when you went from obviously marriage ended and yes. whatever, but 
what was the lead up? How long before you said, I want to buy a house until you actually were moving in? And what, you know, what, what did I that, was in that take? school when I left, when my ex and I broke up, I left, I was in school. I was still in ultrasound school. So I moved back in with my parents. Cause I'm like, all right, I started doing the financials. I'm like, I can rent a room. I can live in someone else's house. It, I mean, it just made no sense to deplete my savings because right. I was making no money when I was going to school full time sure. to do that. Once I finished school, I started working and my next goal was then, okay, at some point I need, I want to become a homeowner. Right. Whatever that it, whatever that meant. And, you know, I can't even tell you how many people over the years were like, why would you buy something? What if you wind up getting remarried? What if you meet someone? And I said, what if, what if I don't? But also what, why that to me, I found context, that so crazy, but I would that would never be a reason to, or not do something. But would anybody say that to a man? No, no, of course not. Like, so no. to me that whatever, like it just, I found that very odd. And I was like, well, this is a goal that I've set for myself, whether I have a partner or not. Right. I want to be in the position where I can take care of myself and I never have to worry right. that someone else has to do it for this me. This is my place. This is my home. I don't have a landlord. Maybe I have to make a monthly payment or whatever, right. but yeah. I, I, I worked, I saved money. I did wind up having a very, very bad car accident where I got a little chunk of change. I'm like, this is it. Now it's time. Right. And that's how I wound up. I didn't want property because I knew I was going to have to work and I was like, I don't have to come home and mow a lawn. I don't want to have to come home and deal right. with, oh, the roof is leaking. Who's going to take it? No, I didn't want to have to deal with any of that, especially because I was alone making yeah. the purchase. So for me, a condo was the, the perfect answer. Right. You know, and, and in my case, what I would call lessons from my father, my dad wasn't necessarily the kind of person who would point his finger at me and tell me what to think. But by paying attention to the actions that yeah. he took, he didn't have to say anything. Yeah. My parents bought a house in Massapequa when they were both still in their 20s. The kind of house that nowadays, seven, eight hundred thousand, and people in their position would not have been able to afford it so easily. An 18% was, yeah. rate on a mortgage back then. My parents never let me forget. Yeah, we could but, 18%. But it, <laughs> yeah. Um, but what, what my dad would say is he he didn't like doing the lawn he didn't like trimming the hedges and doing all that shit so when he and my my mom split he said i'll never be buying another house i'll be living in a community and then he bought the place in huntington and by the time it became possible for me to start thinking in terms of a place like this he's like jerry you don't want to have to cut the lawn and no. he didn't have to say at your but age that's good advice yeah because seriously, who some people are into it. Like some oh, guys, absolutely. they were about, I dated somebody that was very into his lawn. It was weird. My mother but, loved having a garden. Yeah, she some people loved love growing the vegetables. That would, that would have been a problem if she, you know, when she got into her 60s and she moved to Florida. Uh, actually, no, she was in her late 50s when she moved. The point is, she was okay not having her own garden. Right. You know, she started Everything a condo. Everything is a trade-off. Yeah. You, you, you have to... Um, it's like in politics when they say you can't always make the deal you want. You make the best deal you can have. Yeah. You're not going to get everything you want. Maybe if you're really lucky or if you have another phrase my mom would say, unlimited funds. If you have, <laughs> if you have unlimited funds. Yes. Like, listen, I, I, and, and a friend of mine who lives in California, fucking hilarious, uh, a guy and his wife, they, they had this unbelievable house not far from Ojica Castle. But on the opposite side, if you, if you know where Ojica is... Uh, off of Jericho Turnpike, kind of towards Plainview, uh, mm -hmm. on Plainview Road, if you, you were driving towards uh, like Minetto Hill Road. So in that range, there were some crazy multi-million dollar homes right yeah. over there. And so he bought this house new that had to be $2 million, including the property. And um, yeah, he bought a house in California and he, he and his family were moving to California. This is five, six years ago. And so a normal question that you would ask of normal people, even normal people with a lot of money, but again, a lot of money within a normal parameter. When are you selling the house or did you sell the house? No. So who's going to live there? Nobody. He didn't have to. He's got two million dollars. There's nobody living there. That's the kind just of money there. I'm talking about. It's just hanging out there. Yeah. No problem. But normal people have to make choices. This place where I am now, this exact kind of concept with a clubhouse, with a pool, with a tennis court, with the pool tent, with all of this kind of shit. 
In Woodbury, it's $1.1 million. Yes, Woodbury is a sexier area than Corum, no doubt about it. But a normal person eh, living alone is not going to sink $1.1 million. No way. Very often, it's that's not how it's done. So you find a place not to live as in I Woodbury. Did. Yeah. Well, I don't want to be on the water. Okay, see, that's different. So, for, right, you, that's another reason you ended up on the South Shore. I mean, I'm kind of mid. Right. CI is not that. I, I would love to be closer to the water at some point. Wait, wait, wait. I thought you were in Babylon. No. I'm in Central Iceland. I moved from Aspeak to Central Iceland. I don't know why I thought that. <laughs> you know what? It, maybe it was that you were visiting, because there were, there were times where you were, you were at a pool, and, you were, and I thought you were in Babylon. Is, is there a pool? Do you have a friend? Is it something like that? No. Damn, how the fuck I have messed that up? <laughs> it's so... St- I don't know. <laughs> Until 30 seconds ago... If she had said for ten million dollars, does she live in Babylon? Yes. No. Fuck. <laughs> now I, I, said, live in I just the hood, yo. Boom. I have to sell the two million dollar house now. That's it. Done. Damn. I know. All right. So, so I didn't know. So Central Iceland. Yeah. Um, so closer to Jericho Turn uh, at Jericho Turn by Route Twenty Five or which part of, of CI? I'm by the courts and the Duck Stadium. Ah. Okay. So uh, there's a ton of condos and apartments. A lot. Right. Now, it, it, the reason why I bring that up is because I have one friend who lives, it's not It's not a development like yours, but it's, it's a, a development of, of houses mm-hmm. in Central Islip. Um, I don't remember the name, but the point is, there are a lot of different developments. There are certain towns that seem to have a ton of them. And here in Corum, they're, they're going yeah, on. Corum's a lot. Yeah, they're, they're building a lot of them. There's a Fairfield, there's a Heatherwood not far from here. Uh, but most of those are actually just for rent. And again... You start to juggle. Do you want to pay rent for the rent? The this rents is, are expensive. Right. I was Holy paying twenty four hundred a month in the last couple of years. The apartment in Huntington. Now, the apartment that I was living in was a great location for people who know where the Paramount Theater is. I was right there. Huntington Village is amazing. You don't even need a car you if you're like there, me. Yeah. I didn't have to. Get, there's a gym, three gyms within a one block walk. I had the stuff at home, the workout equipment that I now have in the basement here. But twenty four hundred dollars a month. Again, we're we're somewhat joking, but not really. When we say people are frivolously spending, that you could do it for less. Yeah. That you could take good care of yourself and spend one hundred fifty instead of four hundred before a Saturday night. Because if you're making good money, then you should be able to live a certain way. Treat yourself. Yeah, and, and it's within reason. Yeah, it, everything is within reason. One of my friends who's an accountant he told a story. Um, again, not naming names, but he was talking about one of his clients who was an attorney. She had been divorced and she was making $300,000 a year. Now, I don't care who you are. That is a tremendous living. The woman was still in her 30s. This is a baller. This is a serious yeah. person. He said that she was still living pretty much paycheck to paycheck because she was spending so much on oh. everything. And that's something that as a son of an accountant who was very careful. Yes. I, I couldn't relate to it. That was, it was mind blowing that somebody could be making, we're not talking about somebody with a lot of debt. She didn't have any $300,000 in college or student loans. That's it was a lot that of spending. When she was married, she was used to living a multimillionaire kind of lifestyle and just couldn't adjust to normal high life. Jeez. Nobody's saying you can, 300000 a year, you've got no debts and no mortgage. <laughs> How are you living paycheck? Blimey. Because some people, it's not only young people in this case. I don't know. But the, the takeaway is, if it's possible for you to become a homeowner and not spend $2,400 a month on rent, let's put it this way. If somebody, an angel investor, anybody gives you a down payment, or if you're fortunate enough to have a down payment, as was the case with me, it's better to own a house than to pay $30,000 a year in rent That's plus crazy. utilities. Yeah, it's crazy. Even for a fantastic apartment. No yes. thanks. <laughs> right. But it is it is true, though, that... And my friend Joel, I, I love the guy. And, you know, he's a guy, both of his kids, one of them is through college and the other one is, is almost through college. And he, he talked about this. He said, even if you make good money, your mortgage isn't crazy, your cars are paid off, your spouse makes good money... There are going to come points in time where you're going to have to say no because you just don't have money for everything every yeah. month. 
And that is another thing of getting older and budgeting and understanding. Is this a luxury or is this a necessity? And then, you know, the movie yeah. Spaceballs, the joke of take only what you need to survive. And this woman needs her industrial strength hair dryer because she can't live without it. <laughs> but that is that is a real thing. It's cheaper than going to get blowouts every 